At mealtime, many animals prefer company, and their eating companions don't even need to be of the same species. It's even possible to make friends, or at least useful acquaintances. Some animals, for example, make their livelihood as cleaners for much larger species. Keeping them neat and tidy, free of algae or parasites, in return for no more than a quiet meal. The alliance between clownfish and anemones provides both with food and protection. This is a relationship of mutualism in which both species benefit. In other cases, though the relationships are genuine, only one of the partners gains an advantage. It's common to see numerous different species of birds following herds of large African herbivores, whose hooves scare and scatter the small animals, food for the waiting birds. This is precisely what happens with some colorful birds of the savanna, but on a much smaller scale. They don't need the help of elephants and buffaloes, but are content to follow the footsteps of legions of army ants known as marabunta. Eating in company is often more enjoyable than eating alone. And sometimes the relationship goes beyond merely sharing a table. Life in the jungle can be uncomfortable at times. Tropical storms soak every inch of the jungle. Eating and hunting is more complicated in a storm, but life cannot stop for a few drops of water. Capuchin monkeys move from branch to branch, but perhaps with a little more care than usual, not wishing to slip. As through the dense foliage, the eye of a small hawk looks on. Nestled in the branches, it watches as the capuchins explore every inch of their territory. Everything that comes to hand is potential food. 65% of their diet is fruit, and 15% other parts of the plants, even tree bark. And the remaining 20% of their daily menu consists of insects and other small animals. Which is why the hawk observes them closely. He knows that as the troop of monkeys moves around, many terrified insects will flee their path. Capuchins spend about a third of their day searching for food. And all that time, the hawk shadows them inconspicuously among the branches, waiting for his moment. The monkeys act like hunting scouts for the bird, driving the prey towards the hunters waiting in ambush.
and the result is excellent for the bird, which catches a locust that flies up to avoid a passing monkey. These small hawks feed mainly on large tropical insects that live and hide in the foliage of the jungle. And without the unwitting help of the capuchins, they would need to spend much more time every day looking for food. Other species on the forest floor also wait for the capuchin monkeys to pass by. The delicious fruits of the trees are beyond this iguana's reach, so it hopefully watches the truth. Capuchin monkeys like ripe fruit most, and to be sure they are just ripe enough, they feel them, smell them, and even break into them before sinking their teeth into their meal. Blackberries, cashew nuts, and mombin plums are among the most consumed fruits. They delight in eating the pulp and sipping the juice. And when they have consumed what they like best, they throw away the seeds and the fibrous parts. The iguanas just have to be patient and wait. The capuchins waste a lot of the food they find. And the iguanas know that sooner or later, they'll throw away what's left of their snack. So the iguanas act like garbage trucks sweeping up what the troops of monkeys leave behind. And it's a very profitable and tasty job. Small marmosets do the same job as capuchin monkeys and have similar habits. They eat a little of everything and throw away a large part of the fruits they collect. They live in family groups that can exceed 20 individuals that walk around the forest tossing their leftovers to the ground. And for the iguanas, it's manna from heaven. Iguanas are large and fierce-looking lizards, but their diet, especially when adult, is vegetarian. And ripe fruits are an important part of their daily menu. Provided they are lucky enough to have monkeys wasting so much. Winter in the northern hemisphere is very hard, much harder to survive than a tropical storm. But the animals who live here know how to fend for themselves. 
A sizable hungry group has gathered today, waiting for what a big eater might leave on the table. An imperial eagle, with its stomach full, prefers to leave the table than put up with such a large number of annoying freeloaders. And for the queuing diners, the second sitting has begun. A common buzzard is the first to approach the food. It's not usually a fan of carrion or of others' leftovers. The red kite is next in turn. This raptor is a great opportunist and will make the most of any opportunity where food is readily available. The remains of a rabbit are an excellent source of protein and calories that will help it withstand the rigors of winter. But some magpies and crows have also spotted the dish and are not going to leave the kite alone until it goes away. The crow, big and powerful, pecks at the meat and stores it in its beak. It will eat some now, but it will also hide some for when it's hungrier. The cold of winter will help preserve it for quite some time. After the crow is eaten, the magpies are still waiting their turn and will give a good account of the last remaining leftovers. Relationships between different animals often have an unexpected gastronomic component. Leftovers of the hunt are often cleared up by another species, but there also exist much more complex relationships. Some birds, like weavers and blackbirds, form a curious bond with army ants, a bond from which the birds mainly benefit. The legion of ants spread terror wherever they go. Big or small, every animal flees as this army on the march dismembers and devours everything in its path. Small animals that live on the ground make a hurried escape. And it's then that the weavers and blackbirds arrive, attentively following the ants. Thanks to the insect army, the birds can locate and catch dozens of other insects, oblivious to the birds as they escape the marauding legion. The weaver birds make the most of the moment to feast on grubs and bugs of all kinds. But they themselves have to be on their toes to avoid being bitten by the ants. There is an obvious parallel between the marauding ants and the herds of elephant and buffalo moving across the savanna. They cause a multitude of insects and small creatures to take to the air or other routes not to be crushed by the hooves of the large herbivores. But in this case, it's not small birds flitting around the elephant's feet, but raptors, such as the African kite, that patrol above the herds. The kites await their opportunity to pounce on any terrified animal escaping the troop of elephants.
they simply plummet down, grabbing their prey with their deadly, sharp, and accurate claws. Accompanying herbivorous mammals on their treks is a widespread habit. Cattle egrets are well-known patrollers around buffaloes, cows, and antelopes, hunting insects that the grazers scare out of hiding. Other heron species have learned that keeping their cousins company can be profitable. But not all animal relationships are safe and mutually beneficial. There are some that are clearly fatal, at least for one side of the partnership. The colony of sand martins is at its apogee. Hundreds of mating pairs have dug their nests in the sandy slopes, giving them the appearance of gruyere cheese. The bustle of the colony attracts predators such as kites, or this little kestrel, prowling around the entrances of the nests. The kestrel spends much of its time here, perched on different vantage points, waiting for a clear opportunity to hunt. It seems that the colony of San Martins has to pay a fee, a blood duty to the hunters in the area. But the Martins are calm. In their nests, the chicks are safe. Flying at full speed, the parents come and go with food, secure in the knowledge that they are expert aerial acrobats. But the kestrel also seems certain that it will be worth his weight. tries many times, monitoring the entrances of the nests in case a chick gets lost. His technique is to exploit the inexperience of the young martins. Kestrel's technique may seem time-consuming, but it finally succeeds. After dozens of attempts, it captures a sick chick that will compensate for many hours of effort. Part of his catch will be for his own chicks, waiting in the nest, not far from the colony of martins. Hmm. Underwater social relations can be very intense at mealtimes. The definition of mutualism is a biological interaction between individuals of different species in which both benefit and improve their chances of survival and reproduction. And it's often closely related to food. Perhaps the best known example is the one that exists between the clownfish and the anemone. The anemone's poison darts protect the fish from predators, and the clownfish protects the anemone from other fish that might eat it and each species provides the other with food. Clownfish are very recognizable with their intense and contrasting colors. Red, orange, black, yellow or white, which act like traffic lights, a warning that stopping there to eat is not a good idea.
This odd couple of species works in a similar way. Large spiky sea urchins and fish that look much like the clownfish. The fish seem to have no fear of the spikes of the sea urchin. Swimming between them, cleaning the surface of the echinoderm as it picks off food. The two species are inseparable. When, in a moment of great intimacy, the urchins eject their reproductive cells, the fish remain at its side, combing through its spikes and keeping it free from discomfort. When danger appears, the fish lies on the sea urchin, which protects it with its spiky weapons. So the contract between the fish and the urchin is similar to that of the anemones and clowns, cleaning and safety in exchange for protection and food. There are other very sophisticated relationships between species that also have to do with food and cleaning. Moray eels are impressive predators with huge jaws that would scare anyone. But there is a species of small shrimp that fearlessly live around the mouth of the moray. This extraordinary relationship provides a dental cleaning service that ensures the moray's teeth are in perfect condition, free from parasites and other annoyances. The shrimp, meanwhile, finds the most delicious snacks amongst these leftovers. An Egyptian vulture watches from the sky and a wolf returns to the scene of the kill. The pack hunted a doe a couple of days ago, and the low winter temperatures have kept it excellently preserved. will be satiated for a few days, but then hunger will drive them back to the pantry to fill their stomachs again. But they are not alone. Their store has been found by some neighbors who also like meat, cold or otherwise. And with differing degrees of portion, they circle the neighborhood, waiting their turn. And they will have to wait until the wolf goes away. The first to take his chance is a fox that steals a bite and heads away to eat it in a safe place. Next are the opportunistic birds, Vultures and kites share the table as soon as the wolf disappears into the brush. And then a whole series of guests will benefit from the wolf's hunting skills. Commensalism is defined as a form of biological interaction in which one organism benefits without affecting the other. That is to say, it is neither harmed nor gains any actual advantage. In this case, many species take advantage of the wolf's kill. And now it's the turn of a buzzard who prefers this abundant food source rather than spending hours hunting mice or voles. 
The term commensal derives from the Latin commensa, meaning sharing a table, its origin referring to animals that take advantage of hunters' leftovers, in other words, scavengers, who wait for the hunter to finish eating to benefit from the remains of the prey. The wolves will see their pantry reduced by a number of uninvited guests that nibble at their meat reserves. It's clear that the great restaurant, The Earth, is full of striking relationships between diners.